Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus, I save you. Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus.
it's, it's called I believe, but it's, it's a creed. It's like, what do Christians believe? It's a, it's, it's a creed. It's almost like a motto, if you will. And it, sa- it says in Acts chapter 16, it says, um, I believe a jailer was walking up and was asking Paul and Silas, Silas, what do we do? What must we do to be saved? And he said, they said back, they said, believe upon the Lord Jesus and you and your household will be saved. I mean, come on. You want to change your situation? You want to change your family, what's going on in your family? You want to change what's going on around you? You want to break the curses of a generation over your family? Believe in the name of Jesus. Believe, don't, don't, just, don't just listen to the words, but believe in the name of Jesus. He's not just a historical figure. He is the creator. He's the alpha. He is the omega. He is the change. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is everything. And if you believe upon him, your situation will change. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing in this world. We look at this world and we look at all the negative things, but Father, you are still working. You are still in the midst of the situation, Father, and we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for the testimonies of the people in this church, and we we, we thank you for what you're going to do here today. We ask that your word touches hearts and touches lives and draws families together because we believe in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, we're excited to see you guys this morning. We thank you for coming to worship with us. If you're here for the first time, welcome. If you're here every Sunday, welcome as well. If you're watching online, we'll be right back in a few seconds. So step out of the aisle and just greet somebody here this morning. Amen. Christina and I serve with our small groups ministry. Thanks for being here in person or watching online. We pray you feel right at home. Small groups are almost here. We are doing a six week summer semester starting next Sunday, June 9th. We believe that small groups are the heart of our church and help bring deeper fellowship in our community. Rally day is today. So make sure to check out all of the tables in the lobby to find a group. To sign up, just open our Church Center mobile app and click the Groups tab, or visit AbundantLifeChurch.tv slash small groups. We are looking forward to another great summer semester of small groups. ALK Super Camp is next weekend, June 7th through 9th. This is a two-night camp for students completing K through fifth grades. It will be held at Camp Living Waters in La Ronger, Louisiana. The cost is $150 per student. This will be an experience that your child will remember for a lifetime. We are having an informational camp meeting for parents today after service in ALK. 
If you would like to sponsor a student for camp, you can donate any amount by clicking the sponsor option when registering or by going directly to Amy and ALK. Camp United is July 12th through 15th in Panama City Beach, Florida. It is a four day weekend experience where students gather together to focus on Jesus Christ. Every service is packed with high energy worship followed by an impactful and challenging message. Each day is filled with games and activities focused on connecting students together. They will be challenged to dig deep into the Word of God and grow in their relationship with Him. The cost for Camp United this year is $350. This price includes buses, rooms, meals at the camp, and a Camp United t-shirt. Your $100 deposit is due this Wednesday, June 5th, to secure your spot. The full amount for Camp United is due by Wednesday, June 26th. For more information, visit the Connect Desk after service or visit our website. Today, we are receiving an offering for our building fund, which helps to maintain and make improvements to our campus. Thank you so much for your generosity. Your tithes and offerings truly make a difference for the kingdom of God. You can give after service in the offering buckets or anytime through our website or mobile app. For our first time guests, we want to connect with you. Fill out our Connect card in front of you and bring it to one of our serve team members in the lobby. We believe in the power of prayer and want to stand in prayer with you. Please fill out the back of the Connect card for any prayer request you may have and drop it in the offering bucket on your way out. Thanks again for joining us this morning. Connect with us on social media and at AbundantLifeChurch.tv to stay up to date with what's happening. Junior high students, you are now dismissed for your very own service. Amen. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Come on. Who's excited to be in church? Amen. Come on. Man, today is week number one of an eight-part series that we're doing for summer called Legends, Legends of the Faith. Man, I, that's the first time I've seen that message open. That's pretty cool, huh? So today is week number one of that series for summer. I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. But first, first, I want to just welcome everybody to church today. Man, hope everybody survived a storm yesterday afternoon. Man, I was on my way to Baton Rouge about five o'clock, and it started hailing. And so I did the only thing I knew how to do, and that was a pull into the church. I'm going to overhang right here and just wait it out. But uh, just glad to be here today. But I uh, just want to take this opportunity to welcome everybody to church this morning, especially if you are a guest, you're worshiping with us for the first time today. We especially want to welcome you into our service as well. Also want to look right directly into the camera as I do every week and just welcome everyone who may be watching service online today. Thanks so much for tuning in. Church, can we put our hands together one more time this morning and welcome everybody to service. Look, just a few things before I get in the message before we get started. Today is rally day for our summer small week semester. We do a six week small group semester that will be starting next Sunday, but today is rally day. I encourage you, go to the foyer after church. We have tables set up. Find a group to join this summer. Get connected. I believe we have 16 small groups. 16 small groups. The most small groups we've ever had in the summer. Uh, this summer 16, so find a group that to be a part of for our six-week summer semester. Also, kids camp is next weekend. If you have a, a child, kindergarten through fifth grade, next weekend we're going to have a wonderful kids camp. Uh, there's still space. If you have a child who would like to go, go get them signed up. But today, I believe after service, they are having a parent meeting 
in AOK if you have a child going to camp. And then next month, next month is our youth camp, Panama City Beach, Florida. If you have a teenager, man, get them signed up for that. That's going to be a great time next month as well. And today we are receiving an offering. Our offering is going towards our building fund. Helps maintain, improves our campus. And I'll just be honest with you, in the summer, it helps to maintain our air conditioners. Amen. How many people think AC is a good idea when you're at church? Amen. So, so Thank you so much for your giving, your generosity, man. So, so blessed here at Abundant Life Church. And also, I'd get in trouble if I did not mention this, but today, June the 2nd, is my wife, Christina, and I's 24th anniversary. 24th anniversary. In fact, got a great picture. There we go, right there, man. That's us right there. Man, just teenagers, man. I mean, just young teenagers whenever we got married. Not really. We were... Still young, though, but uh, man, so thankful for my wife, Christina. Man, I never will forget the best marriage advice I ever got, and today is not a a marriage uh, message for sure, but the best marriage advice I ever got was from my dad. I just started dating Christina, and he didn't want to see me mess it up, so he just laid it all on the line, and he said, listen, marriage is just like a garden. Really, any relationship is. The more you put into it, the more you work at it, the more you invest in it, the better it's going to be. But the moment you stop investing in it, it's going to die. So I don't know who needed to hear that this morning, but that's worked for us for 24 years. So I'm so thankful for my wife, Christine, and my family. So, hey, today is part number one of an eight-part series for summer. I love to do a summer series. We can kind of zone in on a topic. Uh, And so this summer, we're going to do a series called Legends of the faith, legends of the faith. Let's take a moment and pray. Father, we thank you so much that we can come to church today and worship you. Father, I thank you that every person is here by design, Lord, not by accident, and I pray, God, that your word would just speak to our hearts today in Jesus' name, and all God's people said amen and amen. You know, several years ago, my parents, they had the opportunity to go to Cooperstown, New York, and visit the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. Has anybody ever been up there before? I've never had the opportunity. I know many people have, but uh, they were showing me pictures. And, you know, my dad's favorite team was the New York Yankees. Favorite player was Mickey Mantle. And so he got to take pictures in front of the plaque with Mickey Mantle and see some of the Yankee greats and other baseball players and, uh, in the Baseball Hall of Fame. And, you know, how many people know it's not the Hall of Good? It's the Hall of Great. Only the best of the best make it into the Hall of Fame. It's not for average players. Uh, It's for people who achieve greatness throughout their career, no matter what Hall of Fame it is. And believe it or not, the Bible, God's Word, has a Hall of Fame. It has a Hall of Fame, and it's found in Hebrews chapter 11. We're not going to really read the whole chapter uh, today, but I encourage you to go and read Hebrews chapter 11 over the course of this summer. But Hebrews chapter 11 talks about many of the great men and women of God's word who achieve great things. And uh, just talks, uh, and, and you know, you read the Bible. What I love about the Bible, the Bible is made up of stories of really about normal people like you and I. Normal people who face obstacles, who face issues, who face challenges in their life, but they trusted God, they had faith in God, they believed in God, and God used them to do great things. And one thing I love about the Bible when it talks about the characters of his word is the the Bible just really pulls back the curtain. It doesn't just talk about their victories, but it talks about their struggles as well, how they were just normal people like us, but yet God used them to do great things. And so so this summer, over the course of eight weeks, what we're going to do, we're going to look at the lives of several of the great characters from the Bible. And our goal, our goal from this series to find out is to find out what we can learn from their lives and how we can apply it to ours. And our key verse for this series is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. You know, chapter 11 is God's hall of fame, as we said, and it talks about all the great men and women. And so then we come to Hebrews chapter 12, and look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, therefore, since we also have such a great 
cloud of witnesses surrounding us. He's speaking, the writer of Hebrews is speaking about all the men and women who are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 12, God's hall of fame. We're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses. The Bible says, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin. How many people know that sin will entangle you and cause you to will keep you from becoming all that God has called you to be. But he also talks about obstacles there. How many people know sometimes there's things that are obstacles, obstacles in our lives. They're not sin, but they are things that hold us back from becoming all that God has called us to be. So he said, let's rid ourselves of obstacles. Let's rid ourselves of sin, which entangles us. And he says, let's run with endurance. Let's run with endurance the race that is set before us. And so the question that I want to present to you each week during this series is what if what if one of the cloud of witnesses, one of one of the members of God's Hall of Fame, what if he or she were able to step out of the crowd and spend some time with us? What if we could sit and have coffee or lunch with them? What if they could even come and share from this pulpit? What are some of the things that they would tell us. And the character that we're gonna start with in this series is one that most of you heard of, and it's about a man by the name of Noah. We're all pretty much familiar with Noah, and I'm pretty sure Noah would tell us, hey, don't miss the boat. Come on, am I right? Don't miss the boat. But no, Noah, just a little background on the life of Noah. In fact, you can turn to Genesis chapter six, and and we'll get there in just a moment. But Noah and the ark, You know, we're familiar with that story. It's one of the first stories that we generally learn in Sunday school, Noah and the Ark. Uh, The story of Noah actually occurred about 10 generations after Adam and Eve. So about a thousand years after Adam and Eve is when Noah, uh, Noah's story takes place. And then back then in Bible times, people lived for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. Of years. And in fact, the Bible says that Noah lived for 950 years. 950 years. In fact, his grandfather, Methuselah, oldest living person recorded, he lived for 969 years. Now, that's hard to imagine and fathom, but the Bible says it, and I believe it. Moses, he had three sons Ham, Shem, And Jephthah, if you're having a son uh, in the near future, I encourage you, choose another name besides those three, Sham, Ham, and Jephthah. But during Noah's time, the earth didn't need rain. Uh, In fact, it was kind of watered through these natural springs, so it it didn't rain. And, And the Bible says that Noah was 600 years old when the flood came, and then from that point on, you see a diminished lifespan to generally what it is now. But, but during Noah's time, wickedness had been, began to grow on the earth. Man, I'm telling you, the earth was messed up during Noah's time. And it was so bad that the Bible says that God regretted making mankind and he was ready to wipe the earth clean. And this is kind of where our story picks up in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. The Bible says this, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Look at verse 6. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created and with them the animals, birds, creatures that move for I regret that I have made them. Now I'm thankful the story is not in there because look at verse eight, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Another translation says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Another translation says that Noah, that God was pleased with Noah. And here's the life lesson that we can learn from Noah. Here's what I believe that Noah, the main thing that Noah would tell us, and that's this. He would tell us that one person can make a difference. One person can make a difference with their life. You know, many people don't really think their life 
matters a whole lot, that their life really doesn't have any meaning or purpose, that they're just kind of drifting through life, just breathing air and taking up space. Their life really doesn't have any purpose. But you know, the fact is, God needs every one of us to help make a difference for his kingdom. People think, well, it's just a select few that God has called to make a difference. No, I believe that God has called every single believer to make a difference for his kingdom. Say, Pastor, why is that? Because just like in Noah's time, a day of judgment is coming. A day of judgment is coming because I'm telling you, our world is in the same condition. In fact, I would say it's probably worse as it was in the days of Noah. And see, every single one of us, every single one of us, every single person on the earth, we're either one, we're adding to the wickedness of what's going on. Now, I hope that's not any of us here, but we're, we're, many people, they're just adding to it. Or two, we're just trying to endure the wickedness and everything on. We're just trying to make it through until God takes us home to heaven. Or we're making a difference for God's kingdom. We're being salt and light on the earth. We're being a light that shines in a dark world. And even though the world was so messed up, so corrupted by sin, Noah proved that one person can make a difference. Think about it for a moment. None of us would be here today if it weren't for Noah. Because after the flood, God used Noah and his family to replenish the earth. He used Noah. And and, and the point is, the point is our life is not just about us. Every one of us is called to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Now I want you to look at your notes. I trust you got a copy. If not, they're going to come up on the screen. You can take notes, but there are three areas that I believe God has called each of us to make a difference in. Three areas God has called to make us a difference. And here's the first one. We can make a difference in our family. We can make a difference in our family. Look at Genesis chapter seven, verse one. The Lord then said to Noah, he said, go into the ark, who? You and your whole family. You and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Think about it for a moment. Noah's righteousness, Noah's favor with God. What did it do? It it affected his entire life family. His family was saved because of Noah's godliness and righteousness. And you know, many people, man, they want to make a difference in their career. They want to make a difference on their job. People want to make a difference in in, in the world, in missions trips and doing all these things. And I believe in all that. God has called us to make a difference where we are. But friends, I'm telling you, the number one area God wants you to make a difference in is with your family. He wants you to make a difference with your family, with those you are closest to closest to. The Bible says in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, Pastor Trey said it, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. How many people know salvation is not just about us? It affects our entire family. It affects our entire family because God has called us to be a light shining in a dark world. I had a, I have a friend got saved at a young age in his early 20s, early 20s, lost, far from God. God radically saved and changed his life. It began to affect his whole family, his children, grandchildren, all involved in ministry at some point because of one decision that he made to serve the Lord. You know, sociologists say that most people have a sphere of influence of approximately 12 to 17 people. Now, some people have much more than that, of course. Some people have less, but it's about 12 to 17 people is about the amount of a person's influence. But if you think about it, most of those people would be our families. And friends, just like Noah, let's determine to make a difference in our families first and foremost. Here's another area we're called to make a difference in, and that's this. We can make a difference for our generation. 
We can make a difference for our generation. Now, God bless the generations who have come before us. God bless the generations who are coming after us. But friends, we need to make a difference in our generation right where we are because we have a responsibility to reach our generation. And you know, it's not just about us enjoying life. And man, I love life, man, I enjoy life, but it's about making a difference with the life that God has given us. And you know, when I think about church, the purpose of church, you know, it's not about getting more for ourselves. Church isn't just about coming and getting a great message for yourself and then leaving. No, church is about reaching more people for Jesus. Amen. It's about reaching more people for Jesus. And you know, I believe deeply, greatly in signs and wonders. Man, I believe strongly in manifestations of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the supernatural. And I'm telling you, I pray for those things to happen in our church, to pray in people's lives. But do you want me to tell you what gets me excited the most? What gets me excited the most is to see a person who was lost, but now they're found. A person who is serving God, serving their family. What gets me excited to see a person who were, were kind of maybe on the fringe, just kind of not really committed all the way, but all of a sudden something just clicks in them and they get all in, committed to serving God, serving their families, serving in the church. See, we need to get a vision for the world around us and make a difference in our generation. I love what Acts chapter 13, verse 36, the Bible says this about David, and I believe one week we're gonna talk about David, but the Bible says this. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he served his purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep, he was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. David served his generation. If you're here this morning, and you are a teenager, hey, I encourage you, reach more teenagers. Reach people in your generation. If you're here, uh, your family with young children, hey, begin to reach families with young children. If you're here, maybe you're empty nester, you're, you're, you're no, nobody's home, you and your wife, hey, I encourage you, reach other people who are in the same season of life in you. If you're a business leader in the community, I encourage you, reach more business people in the community. What I'm saying is, let's reach our generation. We can make a difference where we're planted. And let me say this, you can make a difference at any age. Noah proved that. Noah was 500 years old, 500 years old when he built the ark. I'm sure he was going through kind of a mid-millennium crisis. You know what I'm talking about? Man, he didn't go out and buy a sports car. He didn't go out and start joining the gym or anything like that. Noah built a boat, 500 years old. Hey, you can make a difference at any age. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible says this, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. And can I say this? Don't let anyone look down on you because you're old. But set an example. How can we set an example for the believers? In speech, in love, in faith, and in purity. You can make a difference at any age. Hey, don't disqualify yourself from making a difference because you feel like you're too young or you're too old. Friend, I'm telling you, the kingdom of God needs you. No matter what age you're in, no matter what stage of life you're in, I promise you, you can make a difference somehow for the kingdom of God. And here's the final area. The final area we can make a difference in, our family, our generation. Number three, we can all make a difference for God. See, God is looking for people to enlist. He is looking for people to help get the job done. And my word to you is Get off the bench and get in the game. Come on, step off the sidelines and step on the field. Get, in the, get out of the dugout and get on the field. Man, when I played ball, I hated sitting the bench. I, like, I wanted to be in the game where the action was. And so I encourage you, get in the game. Think, think about it. What if Noah would have said to God, Lord, I can't do this. Get somebody else to build the ark. 
I'm not, I'm not going to take on this task or responsibility. We may not be here today if Noah would not have accepted what God called him to do. Because see, the reality is God works and God moves here on earth. How? Through his people. We are the hands and feet of Jesus extended to a lost and dying world. And he wants to use us to make a difference for his kingdom. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, the eyes of the Lord, what does he do? He searches the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And so I encourage you this morning, be bold enough to say, Lord, here I am. Use me to make a difference for your kingdom. And so my question, think, think about this. If Noah could give us some words of encouragement. Come on, if Noah could give us three or, four, three or four points, three or four things to remember, what would Noah say to us? If Noah could speak, what would he say? Here's one thing that I think Noah would say to us. Look at your notes and that's this. Noah would say, don't be afraid to stand out in the crowd. Don't be afraid to stand out in the crowd. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless among the people of his time. Remember, at this time, the Lord was ready to wipe out the entire earth. But the Bible says Noah was blameless among the people. And look at this. And he walked faithfully. He walked faithfully with God. Think for a moment of the opposition that Noah faced. He was the only godly person living at that time. Think about the mockery that Noah may have endured, the, the, the questions people would ask. The question, that, and plus, the Bible says it had never rained, and people are asking, Noah, why are you building a boat? Chances are people didn't even know what a boat was, and here Noah is, building a boat. Here's a good word for, for, for all of us, especially young people. Let me tell you, don't just go with the flow. Don't just go. Noah went against the flow. Listen, if you find yourself in a compromising situation and things are happening that you know are displeasing to God, hey, let me tell you something. Get yourself out of there. Get yourself out of there. If you're in a conversation and gossip and slander starts to break out, listen, let me tell you, shut it down and get away. I know I was recently in a, in a, in a conversation, I was recently at a ball game actually, and I was standing around talking to some people. And man, I'm telling you, one guy just started to vehemently slander another person. And I'm like, man, I have got to get myself out of here. How am I going to do this? And so we're just standing. So I just kind of start easing away. You know, I'm just kind of like, I'm like, I kind of look at one guy, made eye contact with him. Like, man, I'm just, just kind of, you know, you know how you do. And so I was like, I got to get out of here because I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be a part of anything like that. See, God is, God has called us to stand out, not to blend in. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29, 25, that the fear of human opinion, what does it do? It disables, but trusting in God protects us from that. And see, it's time for us as believers to do the right thing when everyone else is doing the wrong thing. And that's what Noah did. Here's the next thing Noah would say to us. Number two, don't be afraid to do something for the first time. Don't be afraid to do something for the first time. How many people know trusting, believing in God always requires a step of faith. Most of the time, it's a leap of faith. Am I, am I right? Not necessarily a step. It requires a leap of faith. That's why I believe that Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible starts out talking about faith and what faith is before it talks about the characters. Think about Noah for a minute. Noah had never built a boat. It had never rained, but yet he was not scared to step out and trust God in faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, the Bible says, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, look at this, in holy fear, 
He built an ark to save his family. He'd never built an ark before, but yet he was not afraid to step out and do something for the first time. See, if you want to make a difference for God's kingdom, the chances are pretty good that he's going to ask you to step out in faith and do something that you've never done before because everything that God calls us to do requires faith. I know this past Tuesday, uh, my brother Stephen and I, we were standing in the foyer talking. They were shooting that, that announcement video that you saw, and he and I were just kind of standing there talking about to go eat some lunch, and all of a sudden, a car pulls up, and a guy gets out with a dog, you know? And so, man, anytime, you know, so God, God's starting to come into the church with his dog, and I'm like, hang on a minute, man. We don't, we don't stay, stay, stay right there. And so, so we're just, we got to talk to the guy. My brother and I, we got to talk to him to find out about him. He was a soldier, hadn't been, come, hadn't been in uh, too long from being overseas, and the dog was one of those uh, com- comfort dogs. You, you know what I'm talking like? And, and so we just began to talk to him, and he just began to share his heart with us. The day before was Memorial Day, and, man, he had lost lots of friends throughout uh, some war campaigns. And so we just began to talk to him. He and I had never counseled anybody like that who had been dealing with the things that he had dealt with. But friends, I'm telling you, I just felt like God was telling my brother and I, hey, let's take a step of faith and let's try to minister to this guy. And so I shared with him the best as I could. Stephen talked to him the best he could. We were able to pray for him. And I'm telling you, as we prayed for this this young man, just tears began to roll down his face as we just shared God's word and other testimonies that that I knew of, of, of people who had been through similar situations that he has. But the point I'm trying to make is we weren't scared to take a step of faith. We, we, we're like, man, we're going to try and help and share and bless this guy. Let me ask you something. What step of faith is God calling you to take right now. What step of faith is God calling you to take? God may be calling you to take a step of faith and witness to a friend or a coworker. He may be calling you to take a step of faith and join a small group for the summer semester. He may be calling you to lead a Bible study on the job. He may be calling you to serve in ministry. He may be calling you to take a step of faith and sponsor a child or a teenager to youth camp. I encourage you, just like Noah, don't be afraid to do something for the first time. And you know, I tell people all the time about our church, about Abundant Life Church. I said, hey, give us one year of your life. Give us one year of your life. Be at church every Sunday that you're in town and physically able to be here. Join a small group. Get involved in a ministry. Begin to serve, be a blessing to other people. And at the end of one year, I can almost guarantee you that your life will be better than what it was. In fact, if it's not, I'll go find another church with you. I'll join with you and we'll go find another church together. But give us one year. But I promise you, it's not going to take one year. I believe it'll take a lot less than that. Don't be afraid to do something for the first time. Here's the next word of encouragement from Noah. And it is, don't be afraid when the storms come. You know, we just did a a series this spring called Hope in the Dark, really centered around that. I encourage you to go back and listen to that if you're in the middle of a storm. But just imagine for a moment what it was like for Noah and his family when the storm actually hit. Think about the lightning, the thunder, the people who were drowning, banging on the ark. And then I'm sure there's just a Uh, In their minds, Noah's probably thinking, man, I hope, I hope I built this boat good enough to float. You know, think about all the things that were going through his mind when the storm was going on. And you know, if you're in the middle of a storm right now, maybe it's a health storm. You may be in a health battle right now. You may be in a financial storm, a relational storm, whatever it may be. I encourage you to stand on the promises of God. The promise of God. In fact, I want to read a promise of God to you from Psalms chapter 91. I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but I encourage you to if you're in the middle of the storm. But the Bible says this. Check out this promise from God. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. 
I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Verse seven, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Verse nine, if you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. Verse 12, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. Come on, what a promise from God's word. Verse 14, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Come on, what a great promise from the word of God. See, when the storms of life hit, and I promise you, we all go through storms in our life. Never forget that God is faithful to his promises. Here's the final, here's the final thing that I believe Noah will tell us, and we'll, we'll wrap it up with this. And that's number four, don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. No matter what you're going through in life, don't ever give up. Up. You know, when I think about Noah, I think of someone who refused to give up and quit. I think of someone who had great endurance, great perseverance. But see, Noah, he had every reason to be discouraged. He was the only godly person on earth at the time. Everything in his culture around him was perverted. No one supported what God had called him to do. God called him to build a boat even though it had never rained. And he was given what seemed like an impossible assignment. The Bible says it took 120 years for Noah to build the ark. Yet Noah was a model of patience, determination, and faith. And as a result, he is in God's hall of fame. Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, the Bible says that Noah did everything just as God commanded him. See, Noah trusted God. He didn't give up. And friend, no matter what you're facing here today in your life, I encourage you to keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Don't throw in the towel. It's not over unless you quit. Keep moving forward. Trust in God. Take steps of faith because God uses people. He blesses people who keep going and don't quit. I never will forget, I asked my dad several years ago, probably uh, when after we had church had gone through that flood and man, even the pandemic that we went to, I asked my dad, founding pastor of our church, faithfully pastored our church for 35 years. I said, dad, what is the key to lasting in ministry. How do you pastor for 35 years? And I was expecting he would give me a a, a three-point outline or a sermon I might could preach to you, but he said, don't quit. He said, don't ever quit. Don't ever give up. Keep moving forward. Keep trusting God. Keep faithfully serving, praying. Keep on believing. Don't quit. See, when you don't see results fast enough, as fast as you would like, God says, keep going. Man, when you're frustrated about everything that's going on around you and just things just don't seem to be happening for you, God says to keep going. When the odds are stacked against you and your life seems to be falling apart, man, you're in a season of your life that you never thought you would go through. You're experiencing things that you never thought you would face. God says to keep moving forward. You know, I believe that one of the most meaningless statistics in all of sports is the halftime score. Come on, nobody remembers the halftime score, am I right? The halftime score. In Super Bowl 51, the Falcons were beating the Patriots 21 to three at halftime. Most fans had counted the Patriots out because no team had ever erased a double digit halftime deficit to come back and win the Super Bowl. But in the end, Tom Brady and the Patriots beat the Falcons 34 to 28. One of the greatest comebacks in Super Bowl history. 
See, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul tells us, he says, let's not get tired of doing what is good because at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Friends, listen, don't get tired of doing what God has called you to do because your time to reap may be just around the corner. It may be right there. And I encourage you today, just like Noah, don't give up. Keep on trusting. Keep on believing. Keep on praying and trusting God because in due season, we will reap if we don't quit. I want to close with this scripture. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. The words of Jesus, he said this. He said, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Friends, we can make a difference in our family. We can make a difference in this world. We can make a difference in our generation for God's kingdom. Why? Because he is with us. Amen. Can we bow our heads and pray? Father, I thank you so much that, Lord, you are always with us. God, no matter what we go through in life, no matter what storm we face, what obstacle, Lord, no matter what we may go in through, Father, we thank you, Lord, that, God, you are always with us. And, Father, I pray for people today in Jesus' name. Maybe you're here today and say, Pastor, I desperately want to make a difference for my family. In fact, you may have family members who are lost and need the Lord. Father, right now, I pray for people, Lord, who have family members who, who are, God, lost in their lives, Lord, who desperately need to experience your grace and your salvation. Father, I stand with your people right now, Lord, and we just pray for family members. God, help us make a difference in our family. Father, I pray for, for, for parents, Lord, who have children, Lord, who have strayed away from you and your word. God, I pray that you would just draw them back to you. God, that they would experience your love and mercy and grace and salvation. Father, I pray for us that, Lord, we would just begin to make a difference in our sphere of influence. Father, the people that we come in contact with on our jobs and in in places that we go, Lord, the people that we're around, Lord, help us make a difference in their lives. God, I pray you'd help us make a difference for your kingdom. Father, I pray for people today that no matter what age they are, what stage of life they're in, God, I just pray that you would just speak to them, Lord, on how they can make a difference, Lord, for your kingdom today. Father, I pray for people this morning who may be going through a storm in their life, God. Father, where there may be a physical storm that they desperately need healing in their life. God, I pray for people today, Lord, who have physical needs that you would heal, Lord, and touch their bodies. People are going through financial storms, relational storms. I just pray, God, that they would stand on the promises of your word, that, God, you are always with us. Lord, we thank you for that. And we believe that in faith, in Jesus' name. Now, if you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I have never made a decision to accept Jesus into my life. I've never made a, a, a move to make him the Lord of my life. I've never believed in my heart. I've never confessed with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord. But today, I de- realize that I desperately need him in my life. Friends, we never close our service without giving people a chance to make the greatest decision of their life. And if that's you today, you say, Pastor, I need Jesus in my life. Come on, would you raise your hand up real high? I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I just ask you to raise your hand and I want to lead you in a prayer. Amen. I see your hand right there. I see your hand in the back. Amen. Say, Pastor, I desperately need Jesus in my life today. I want to take the time right now to lead you in a prayer. And you can pray this prayer with me, or you can pray a prayer that goes something like this. And it's, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross, paying the price for my sin. Today, I ask you to come into my life, to change me, forgive me, to make me a new person. For today, I accept you and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I give you my life in Jesus' name. Amen 
and amen. Come on, church, can we put our hands together? Can we celebrate? Can we congratulate everybody that we got to pray with over all those needs today? Hey, here's how we're going to close our service. I want to invite everybody to stand. Our worship team is going to lead us in a closing song, and our prayer team is going to come to the front. And listen, if we can pray with you this morning personally about anything in your life that you may be going through, we believe in the power of laying on of hands, the power of agreement. Our prayer team will be at the front. As we sing and close with this song, I want to invite you to the front to receive prayer. God bless you. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. We believe, and I believe.
May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. The Lord fill you today with his goodness, his mercy, and grace. For we bless you.